Can you guess the picture shown to your left? It's the inside of your sanitary sewer lines. The gigantic solid deposition attached to the sewer walls reduces the sewage carrying capacity and causes sanitary sewer overflows. You are probably wondering, where does this come from? Well, we are partly responsible for it. Let me ask, what do you do excess fat oil and grease after cooking? Many people pour it down to the kitchen sink from where it ends up in the sewer system. There, it reacts with calcium to form this sewer giant and also known as fog deposits. In the United States, around 2 billion gallons of wastewater are released annually because of these sewer giants, costing 25 billion taxpayers' dollars to clean up. So, don't be surprised if one day your basement or street is flooded with sewage. But don't get frightened as well, because I have a solution. You know that fog deposit, uh, the key uh, ingredients for fog deposit is fat, oil, and grease, and calcium. Calcium comes from cement used in swell line construction. Cement has two calcium component, calcium hydroxide, which has calcium loosely bonded and can easily release to wastewater. The other one is calcium silicate hydrates, where the calcium is strongly bonded. In my research, I am replacing a part of cement with fly ash. That has two benefits. It has low calcium content, and it can react with cement to convert a percentage of CH, calcium hydroxide, to calcium silicate hydrates. Now, you're thinking, where can we find fly ash? Well, fly ash is a byproduct of coal fire power plants, and power plants are looking for safer ways to get rid of it. In my research, I have found that 50% replacement of fly ash can reduce the fog deposition formation by 55%. Well, during the start of my research, I was, my aim was to reduce the swear giants. But as I progressed, I realized my work can actually m benefit in, many, in multiple ways. It can reduce the fog deposition formation, thereby reduce the, thereby save a chunk of taxpayers' money. It can reuse the fly ash and can reduce the water waste contamination. And most importantly, it can reduce the cost of soil and construction and save us a lot of money. There, I'm trying my part to reduce the swear giant formation, and you can too, by not pouring fat oil and grease through the kitchen sink. Thank you. Have you heard of the recent Australian wildfires? Looks like most of you. In the US, the health cost of fire-related health damage is $100 billion, double the annual budget of an entire small country like Bangladesh. To reduce the risk of these catastrophic wildfires, land managers intentionally burn controlled fires, which we call prescribed burns. However, here in the southeastern US, this prescribed fire is the largest source of small particles called PM2.5, the most concerning particle in year. So prescribed fire has both positive and negative impact, which has created a competing interest between the land managers and the year quality regulators. In my research, I'm trying to merge these two interests by minimizing the year quality and associated health impact from these burns. Now the question is how? I'm investigating the factors influencing burn impact by using a state of science year quality model, which consider change in emission, meteorology, particle transport, and all possible chemistry that might occur within the atmosphere. My results shows that at each of the day with unhealthy air quality index, there was a prescribed burn in this region. And we also found that these burns are likely to cause thousands of premature deaths and illness. Interestingly, the people living in the region highly impacted by these burns are also found to be socioeconomically disadvantaged. You might now thinking, should we still burn? My work shows that you could burn a fire with minimized impact by choosing a proper time of the day, weather condition, and burn techniques. 
based on my numerous model simulations, now I am developing a simplified tool which everyone can run easily to assess the prescribed burn impact. For example, if you want to hold a fire this afternoon, my tool will estimate how many people might have to visit hospital for asthma or other illness due to particle release. You can also adjust this tool to see how this number would change if you burn tomorrow morning instead. Thus, my research doesn't just help mitigating the disagreement between land managers and ER quality researchers. It's important for every individual who wants to breathe a fresh air and also while keeping the society safe by managing some of the land in a controlled way. Thank you. We all talk about a future with more electric cars, but how can we generate this large amount of electricity? We cannot depend on coal and gas power plants if we hope to reduce carbon emissions. And renewable energy cannot provide for that demand baseload. We need nuclear energy to satisfy that large demand 24 hours a day. Nuclear energy is already a big part of our lives as it supplies 25% of our nation's electricity and 33% of our state's electricity. There is some hysteria around nuclear energy due to past incidents such as the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. During an accident, an operator is expected to make quick decisions in a very stressful environment which could lead to poor decisions. An operator has access to a limited number of instructions, whereas in reality, there could be thousands of possible scenarios. He also cannot predict the response of the plant to his actions. For example, in the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, the operators had a few minutes to take decisions and their hasty decisions led to an even more unstable state of the reactor. Therefore, to help the operator make better decisions, along with the future knowledge of the response of the plant, I propose to develop a digital twin. Currently, I'm working on developing such models for the structural safety systems of a nuclear reactor. First, I develop the digital model of the system. Then I collect the response of the system to thousands of scenarios that the plant can experience in its lifetime. This response is stored in the digital twin. Now during an accident or even during normal operations, our digital twin continuously collects real-time sensor data from the reactor, which enables the digital twin to age with the plant. Then we use machine learning algorithms to compare this real-time sensor data with the previously stored response and predict potential actions for the operator. Think of this like a weather prediction with, for example, 80% chance of rain, but also 20% chance of snow. It helps us plan our day better. In this case, the digital twins predictions helps the operator make better decisions and helps her understand the consequences of her actions. Thus, our digital twin is enabling safer operation of nuclear reactors, thereby reducing negative energy, negative concerns towards nuclear energy, and it's also helping us reduce future carbon emissions due to electricity generation. Thank you. Have you ever been to a lake or the beach and the water was so green that you didn't want to get into it? This has likely happened if you're going in North Carolina because according to the EPA, over 41% of lakes are impaired or what's otherwise known as affected by eutrophication. Eutrophication is quite simply what happens when there's too many nutrients flowing into a water system. And when this happens, it causes a large bloom of algae. These algae grow and they die and they sink to the bottom and release a, chemical, a bunch of chemicals that cause a suite of problems. These chemicals can cause increased costs to our drinking water uh, because they'll require us to spend more money on disinfection, more money on reducing taste and odor compounds, and more money on removing the potentially toxic chemicals these algae produce. The result of this is that we have impacts on the environment and we have impacts on our budget and how much we spend for our water. 
But the solution to eutrophication is fairly simple. You just have to reduce the amount of nutrients flowing into the system. However, when we reduce the amount of nutrients flowing in from the watershed, perhaps by 50%, you don't see a 50% reduction in the concentration of, of lakes or other bodies of water. And this is where my research comes in. I've developed a model that represents what happens when you have nutrients coming in from the watershed, nutrients flowing out through the lake, and then especially what happens in the sediment there. Because the sediment layer is where it gets interesting and also where things start to go wrong. That sediment layer acts like a bank. During periods where you have large amounts of nutrient input, it'll store up in nutrients and it will hold them until conditions are different and then it can start to release them back into the lake. This nutrient release will slow down the response of the lake to uh, nutrient inputs, a reduction in nutrient inputs. And that slower response changes how we need to plan for our future. So the results of my research can, are, are, have multiple points. First of all, if we look at this graph here, it's a graph of the amount of nutrients stored in sediment over time under different conditions. We can see that I have different conditions labeled from 100% uh, increase to 100% reduction. And this allows me to answer two very important questions for uh, lake managers and people controlling the kinds of inputs that are allowed to go into our waterways. These two questions are, first of all, how much time will it take to respond and how much the lake will respond. And in the case of Jordan Lake, we can see that it can take up to 50 years for it to respond instead of the 30 years that it's been in existence so far. So what we need to keep in mind here is that we spent 30 years allowing too many nutrients to flow into this lake system, and instead it will take as much time or longer for that to be fixed, which means that we need to take more care and spend more time trying to fix this in the future. Thank you. Imagine you are walking in a rainy day. A car passes by and splashes the muddy water in a pothole on you. What would you think at that moment? Let me tell you another story. How much do you think that you spend on your car to fix the issues like misalignment or suspension system issues that is caused by pav poor pavement condition? The story gets worse if you know that millions of dollars that people pay for their taxes is being spent on the road, road maintenance and construction every year. So my dissertation focuses on solving these issues. Asphalt mixtures consist of two main important, uh, components, uh, rocks and aggregates. The, uh, the, uh, sorry, rocks and asphalt. The asphalt part uh, works such a glue and stick the aggregates together. So in order to have a better mix, you need to have I would call it cooking recipe. So all you need to know to design a good asphalt mixture is to have an amount and type of asphalt and rock. So this cooking recipe is really important because asphalt mixture is a very complex com uh, composite material. And in order to design a good mixture, you need to know these amounts. So in the civil engineering, we call these uh, cooking recipes mixed design. In the current specification, which I would call it traditional uh, specification, uh, there are some kind of empirical rule of thumbs, which is based on some uh, basic fundamental engineering. But uh, you, uh, when you want to design asphalt, you really need to know a better recipe. Uh, it means that, for example, when you have less amount of asphalt in your mixture, the asphalt gets dry and it starts cracking. But what if, if you put a lot of asphalt in it? So the asphalt will deform under the load trucks. So we really need the magic recipe. My dissertation suggests that magic recipe. So it means that it uh, employs some fundamental engineering and some material models that has been developed here at NC State. So by employing that material models, you can balance the amount of rocks and asphalt. So if you have a better balance, then you can predict the, uh, the longer life. So in a case study that we had, we could increase the life of the pavement by nine years compared to the traditional mix that we have right now. So I hope in near future, when you and your family drive on pavement roads, you, will, you won't see that much of crack and potholes. 
Thank you. What do nail polisher, pizza box, dental floss, and also non-sticky frying pan have in common? They can be dangerous to your health. Wait, we use this, don't we? So how come? Because many of them contain persistent organic chemicals that don't easily break down in the environment and can accumulate in your body. A group of man-made chemicals called per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. There are roughly 5,000 PFAS species in this world, and some are extensively used than the others. But one thing for certain, PFAS is a contaminant of organic of a emerging concern. Exposure to PFAS can make our hormone system being disrupted. Exposure to PFAS can make our immune system being compromised. Exposure to PFAS can increase the risk of getting cancer. And exposure to PFAS in North Carolina is the third highest in the United States. Now, PFAS contaminated water is typically treated in a water treatment plant with the carbon filtration being the most popular method. However, using carbon for PFAS absorption is not without its concern, some of which are its limited absorption capacity and also its inability to remove certain types of PFAS. So our project to answer, to answer this question is, we propose emerging technology that can remove species by, PFAS species by using an electrical property of PFAS and activated carbon. This technology called capacitive deionization or CDI. Typically used for seawater desalination, CDI is a proven technology that can remove charred species from the water such as PFAS using an electrical absorption by using a low level voltage that can even be supplied by a AAA battery. In our project, we investigate the effectiveness of electricity to remove to remove PFAS from the water, we examined six different types of PFAS and found out that by applying voltage onto activated carbon, we can remove PFAS from the water by up to 250% compared to physical absorption. We're also developing a model that can be, that can be used as a predictive tool for the stakeholders to optimize the method. So all in all, my results suggest that Electrically assisted activated carbon can be used as a promising improvement for PFAS treatment and it can provide us with a predictive solution for PFAS challenge uh, that we are currently dealing with. Thank you. How many of you have had a campfire before? Oh, quite a lot. Now imagine you are doing a campfire but inside the kitchen. So what do you think will happen next? After some time, your eyes will be watering, you will start coughing, and you can hardly breathe in. This is bad, right? You will be horrified to know that this is the way half of all population do cooking every single day. And the emissions from this type of indoor open fire or primitive stoves contain a range of health damaging pollutants which are causing around 4 million premature death annually. This is like 10 times of Raleigh population are dying every single year. These emissions also have adverse climate impacts. It emits something called black carbon, which is the second largest contributor to climate change after carbon dioxide. In many places in the world, residential wood burning contributes more black carbon to atmosphere than all the cars trucks and industries combined. So to reduce the harmful impact of primitive stoves, a wide range of improved stove models have been introduced worldwide. My research is to assess the performance of these improved stoves and compare it with primitive stoves. That's why I do emission measurement from these stove models in the lab. But you know, lab testing and real world cooking are different. That's why we also have been measuring emissions from these stove models in real world kitchen in many countries like India, Mexico, Malawi, and Rwanda, which are quite challenging considering the resource and technology constraint in many places. So what I have found, most of the improved stoves showed promising performance in the lab. However, only few of them kept this promise in the real kitchen. Even for the same stove model, I found 
two to ten times higher emissions in the kitchen compared to lab. My research shows that cooking practices and fuel loot characteristics are important factors to it. Some improved stoves, especially the gaseous stoves, showed 50 to 75 percent reduction in indoor pollutant levels. But the question is, how clean do we need to be? If we want an indoor environment where there is no health risk, we need 50 to 100 times reduction. But my research shows 2 to 4 times reduction achieved so far from these improved stoves. So hopefully in future, we will be able to reduce the stove emissions to such a level that it will pose no threat to human health and climate. Thank you. Anyone who has ever driven in an urban street being frustrated by hitting red lights again and again when nothing's coming from other direction has probably wondered, are these traffic lights really working? Probably they are. Probably they are time 10 years before you were there. Speaking of which, most of the traffic signals are scheduled for retiming once in every 10 years. 10 years ago, we have limited amount of data, but right now we have plenty of real time data, but still, we are confining ourselves to the old system. So in my doctoral research, my goal was to account the immediate needs of the drivers. I designed traffic signal control algorithms where traffic lights in the network updates its signal timing every few seconds based on the data it collected from its surrounding. This way, it can quickly respond to its current situation. However, it may give you signal plans that let you through one intersection quite easily but you may end up being in a longer queue in other part of the network. Because their decisions are not coordinated to tackle this type of situation, we ensure that signal control system we design effectively communicate with each other. Predicted number of vehicle coming and outgoing from one intersection to another intersection will be shared among adjacent intersection. This way, each of these intersections has a broader view about the network traffic and the signal time it can find not only good for itself, but also for the whole network. The signal control system we designed not only work for car, but also for transit vehicles, emergency vehicles, pedestrian, both for peak and off peak traffic. If you are in a transit vehicle, the signal control system will help you navigate through the network with minimum stops at intersections. For emergency vehicles, no stops at all. After seeing promising performance about the mobility, the government funded our projects to improve the fuel efficiency of the vehicles through signal control. Right now, we improved our signal control system. This control system that we have will help you navigate through the network with minimum fuel consumption without increasing your travel time. Currently, here in the United States, there are more than 500 intersections equipped with communication facilities where vehicle and infrastructure can talk to each other. By the end of this year, there will be 2,000 more. So now it is the best time to think about a signal control system that actually cares about you. I'm a transportation engineer. As a transportation engineer, it's my lifelong goal to have a safe and sustainable transportation system that does not compromise with efficiency. And by the way, next time you go through a, a green light without unnecessary waiting, you know who to thank. Thank you all. <laughs> Okay, five years ago, I went for a vacation to the island Boracay, which is located in the Philippines. I expected to see something like this, but actually when I got there, I saw that. Um, this water quality issue is called um, algal blooms, and it is due to eutrophication. Eutrophication is an enrichment of natural waters with nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. Eutrophication is the result of human activities, such as wastewater effluent or um, uh, application of fertilizer. Eutrophic eutrophication causes algal blooms and, uh, re um, and it actually um, uh, damages fisheries, ecosystems. Um, the conservative estimate of um, um, losses from eutrophication in the United States um, and Europe is $3.5 billion annually. In contrast, 
the annual aid to Africa in 2017 was $30 billion. How can we improve eutrophication? We need to reduce uh, nutrient loadings, but we can't just stop agriculture. Um, uh, in order to address this question, I developed these models which link the amount of nutrient loadings to the uh, variables of interest like um, uh, chlorophyll A concentration or dissolved oxygen. These models are novel because they uh, combine the advantages from mechanistic and statistical models. They include the most relative um, biophysical interactions and they are informed by the observational data. The predictions from these models um, uh, can help to test the system response to the nutrient loadings. For example, in the News River estuary, which is located here in North Carolina, a 30% reduction in nutrient loadings will result into a 25% uh, decrease in the number of hypoxic days and 15% decrease in the chlorophyll A concentrations. This will uh, help to meet the compliance with NC North Carolina water quality standard and actually reduce the ecosystem stress. The goal of my research is to make sure that next time you arrive to the beach, the reality meets your expectations. And you see this, not that. Thank you. Did you know the cardiovascular diseases such as heart attack, strokes are the leading causes of death globally in each year? According to the World Health Organization, in 2016, nearly 18 million people died from these diseases, representing 31% of all global deaths. How do these diseases happen? Arteries are the tubes that carry blood from heart to the whole body. Now, if fat starts getting accumulated inside it, the arteries will go stiffer and it will restrain the blood supply to the vital organs and then these organs fail. So, measuring the artery stiffness is a good attempt to diagnose the cardiovascular disease before it's too late. With the existing technology angiography, we inject chemicals into the blood vessels, but this procedure is invasive and the chemicals create further complications for some patients. So, we want a completely non-invasive procedure to make it safer for everyone. In my research, we use the ultrasound technology, the same technology that we apply on the mother's abdomen to check unborn baby. This procedure is completely non-invasive and we will apply it to the carotid artery. The carotid artery stiffness increase is one of the many indicators for most of the cardiovascular diseases. Moreover, its simple shape and accessibility in the clinical setting make our approach easier. Next, we generated a numerical model on the computer that has cylindrical shape which can mimic the healthy human carotid artery and we added fluid inside it to simulate blood. Our numerical model can capture the movement of the wall when the ultrasound wave goes through it. So, we have one set of data from our experimental model and another set of data from our numerical model. By matching these two data sets, we can back calculate the artery stiffness which can be used for the early detection of the cardiovascular disease. To support our approach experimentally, we applied it on rubber tube experiment in which we chose the rubber tube material and geometric properties close to the carotid artery. Our method showed very promising results with less than 2% error in these experiments. We will now work with the patient data for the clinical trials. Once our method gets clinically approved, we will be able to detect the cardiovascular diseases in a non-invasive manner way ahead of when a red flag actually shows up. Moreover, our approach is more feasible in places where access to the healthcare is limited. So, getting your heart tested will be as quick as having your blood pressure taken. Thank you.